entertaining. Um, that was good. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I might do a keynote speech on test cricket just to mix it up, if that's all right. If that's all right. No, only, only joking. Um, so yeah, I'm Nick Glover, um, part of the inclusive learning team. Um, I've just got a really quick job introducing our student panel. I'm not going to name them because um, Mona, the chair, is going to do that. Um, but just to say, it kind of feels really powerful to have a student panel talking about student journeys first rather than a keynote speech. So I want to introduce them. Um, Mona, do you want to come up and introduce everyone and enjoy the day? So, hi everyone, uh, welcome. Um, my name is Mona Hassan. I'm on placement with the Inclusive Learning Team. It's my 10th month, so I'm almost going back to my final year uh, studying business and management. And yeah, I just want to say it's a great privilege to be here. Um, we think it's particularly powerful to be opening the Learning and Teaching Conference with a student panel. Um, we believe that certain student perspectives enable a much richer understanding on how teaching takes place, how our own student journeys shape us, and what levels can be taken at a university strategy level. Um, so I think that's enough of me talking for now, and I'll hand it over to our lovely panelists if they'd like to introduce themselves. <clears throat> testing, testing, fantastic. Um, so my name is Phoebe Dorje. I am, well, as of Monday, officially a fourth year medical student at the Holyoke Medical School, and I'm also a member of the student expert panel. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah Carter. I am a postgraduate student in the Master of Public Health program, and I'm also the postgraduate department rep for health sciences. Um, I'm Lily Vietz, and I'm a first year environmental geography student, and I'm also a member of the student action group. Hi, my name is Zhang Teng. I'm the academic officer in GSA, and I'm graduate from the, the Department of Education, MA Education. Great. Um, so we're, the panel's basically split into three sections. So the first section, we're going to talk a bit about uh, engagement, and then the role of staff in supporting student journeys. And then we're going to talk a bit about our own student journeys and some reflections. Um, just to note, we're not here to represent the entire student body at university, but rather share our experiences and perspectives, and hopefully we can all learn a few things from each other today. Um, so the first question is, um, tell us a story from your student journey about something that has made a real difference in your learning, engagement, and or a sense of belonging at York. So I don't know who'd like to go first. You can take it away, Phoebe. Um, so I always kind of say, I joined the student expert panel, and genuinely I think it changed my entire life. Um, so with the panel, it gives you the opportunity to kind of have a say on what goes on within the university concerning staff and students. And I think for me, having that opportunity to help people belong more is what makes me feel like I belong, so that kind of influence. And I think through the panel, doing events such as Middle Ground and um, May? Yeah, in May, me and my friend went to Greece um, City College to talk about it, and just different things like that have really helped impact and kind of shape why I feel like I belong at York, but also kind of being active um, in different, like, I guess it's kind of goes into engagement, like events and things. Um, so friends, so friends and I, we did a fashion show. And again, just different things to make sure that students have that opportunity where they see people who look like them and are able to learn from that kind of culture. And also because I like medicine, you know, it's fun. Uh, to broadly speak, for the whole overall teaching experience. Uh, I'm from a public health background. My undergraduate degree is in that. And I felt very intimidated coming here, feeling like I had to have a zeroed in research focus that I had to know what I was doing for the rest of my life. And I would just say uh, one of the biggest impacts I've had is not having to have a focus and having my life figured out here. Uh, the way the public health program is structured is you can pick option modules. And within those modules, the overall encouragement of exposure to different areas of public health has been very inspiring because it, it's definitely helped me realize I don't have to have it all together, but it's given me more of a focus as a result of exposure to all that. Um, the thought from me is like, as a non-native international student, uh, at, at the beginning it's really hard but because I'm going to use an example from Phoebe. So, Phoebe told me a really interesting story. It's like one of international students mentioned, for example, in China, when they join a really crowded bus. So if they are really crowded, there are a lot of people over there, we're just going to say, move. And there's no please, no sorry. So 
at that like mindset and stereotype of my uh, language background. So when I speak in English at the first time, it's really blunt, and I don't know how to say excuse me or please. So at the beginning, a lot of my classmates or the staff member in the university they thought I was a really rude person. So I I'm saying that because like I really want to thank my professor Pola in the University of York. So it's like if the staff member in the university they can encourage you and they can uh, make you feel comfortable speak another language, I think it's make really difference for me. And also I want to say like uh, the language is the first step learning and living in another country. This is really important for all of non-native non -native speaker, international student. So I think uh, if you can speak proper English or if I can communicate with English to each other, this is going to increase my engagement and a sense of belonging like really much. Um, I've obviously only been at the university for a year, but um, I'd say the student action group that I was part of was probably the um, main influence that, like, on me for engaging me in the university because it, like, it sort of brought me in contact with lecturers and other people in the department, like second years, third years, even like postgraduates and everything. So I felt much more comfortable, like, just speaking to people in the department and almost like getting in contact with people if I needed any support or just seeing lecturers as like just people that I could talk to and approach rather than someone who was sort of like an authoritative figure at the front of a theatre that you never spoke to. So I'd say that for me was my like most important influence at uni so far. Oh, that's great. I feel like I can relate a bit to each part as an international student as well. Um, but I really do think that it's, it's kind of about the people you meet at the start and then it kind of builds up from there, so on the departmental level. And then once you gain the confidence to kind of join extracurriculars or apply for internships and that kind of thing, I think that really shapes the student experience. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to add anything to that or should we move on to the next question? Yeah, okay. Um, so what made you decide to come to York initially? I don't know who'd like to start. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so if I'm being honest, I would say financials had a big influence. School in the United States is astronomically expensive. So that was the first driving point. And then the um, being able to have the course done in a year versus two years technically was a big influence. But all of those decisions have really led up to something that I'm, I'm very excited to be here for, um, just getting the chance to learn from a different perspective alongside students from all over the world has been really inspiring. Um, so before I continue, I just want to say I really like it here and York is fantastic, but I didn't choose York. I feel like York chose me. So um, I studied medicine and you applied to kind of different unis. So I applied to whole York because one of the teachers in my school said apply. And we had like an entrance exam and my score was a bit, eh, but my grades were good. Um, so I applied, I guess, for Bantz and I just applied and whatever. And then York rejected me and I remember saying, I don't want to go there anyway, it doesn't matter. And so I, um, as of March um, 2020, I had no offers from any medical school. And then um, obviously that was the year COVID happened, so we didn't sit exams. And I was like to my parents, okay, now that I have no options, and they were like, do you want to try international unis? Because I'm Canadian, they're like, do you want to go to Canada? I was like, no, I want to go to university in the UK, and I'm going to go there. I don't know how, but by God's grace, it will happen. And so um, kind of went through lockdown, and then um, I remember like emailing so many different unis um, with my grades, or well, my predicted grades, and different things like that, and saying, because my thing was always, if you get me to an interview, I can win you over. But before the kind of application, I'm just a number, you know what I mean? So um, did that, and then I sent various different emails. So then um, IB results, I did international baccalaureate, so you get your results a month before A-levels. So I had a bit of a guide, and so I'd sent emails to different staff members, like they got tired of me. Um, and they were like, you have to wait till A-level results day. And I was like, okay, no problem. Um, but I had like a month in advance to kind of plan and see what I want to do. Um, so A-level results, they came, and I have like a large family. So I, everyone's phone, like everyone's job that day was to support me. So the house phone, my grandmother's phone, my dad's phone, mom, sisters, um, and we called up different unis. And so as I'm calling different unis through clearing, if you're on the phone to one or you're on hold, I think I was like two from another uni. And then a call came in and I was like, oh, do I pick up? Do I not? And it said York, so I was like, okay, let me pick up. Picked up. And they were like, hi, we want to offer you an interview. I was like, yeah, cool. And they were like, um, 
this two o'clock sounded, I think it was like one, and we'd been calling from like 8 a.m. So I was like, that's fantastic. Um, and I remember like rushing, looking for any form of like smart clothing because lockdown, you were wearing joggers. And so <laughs> I did the interview. Actually, after, I guess, after I cut the phone from York, then other unis started calling me and was like, we want to give you an interview, we want to give you an interview. And I was like, oh my goodness. And so I did the York interview at like two, and then at four o'clock they called and were like, you have an offer. And I was like, oh, fantastic. Um, and so, yeah, I always kind of feel like York chose me because technically I was rejected and then they chose me. And then even on the drive kind of to York, I remember being like, oh my gosh, if, you can, if I can get an offer in London for a med school, I'd love to go there. Because again, I'm a Londoner at heart. So, but I think kind of coming to York um, and being a part of this kind of York community and learning and doing different things, I'm like, York may not have been where I initially chose, but I feel like it's exactly where I'm supposed to be. Um, and I like it here. Um, unlike the others, I actually did want to go. I actually did want to go here, um, mainly because of the course. I just think they took a slightly different approach to the geography course than, like, other unis did, with a more sort of people and the environment focus rather than just, you know, just the rocks, because that kind of bores me a little bit. Um, so that was my main reason. Obviously, I was there wasn't many open days for when I was choosing my uni, so it was really based on online and what you thought of the courses and cities I'd already been to. And because I'm from the north, I was very stubborn about not really going too far south. So York, York was pretty much my limit. Um, so I did well not going to Newcastle, so that was a step. But like it was mainly the course and then I got the offer and I went on the post office visit day. And just straight after that, I like firmed it and applied for accommodation, everything, because I just loved the campus. It was just, I don't know what it was. It was one of those cliche moments where you're like, I just know that this is where I want to be. And just, I think it was like all the lakes and everything and how like, like many green spaces where I was, just felt very at home. And I just really enjoyed like my day and thought, you know, this is where I'd like to come. So that, that was actually my, so I did want to come here. <laughs> Um, I can't represent all of the Chinese international students, but I would say, like a lot of Chinese international students, they come to, they choosing the university to abroad because if the agency suggests them, like this is a really good one and this is a really good one, and also because of the online limitations, so we can't use Google to doing some research about how the university looks like, and. So it's quite limited when I come here. So the reason I come here because one of my family members suggested me come over there. And another reason is the campus is really beautiful. So I can't do like further research about what's going on, but I think the reputation is really important for uh, international students. So I heard a lot of really good things from the University of York. So this is the reason I choose here. Amazing. I feel like it's really interesting to hear the different ways that brought us here, but we're kind of all doing the same thing now. Um, I can relate to the IB thing because I did the International Baccalaureate as well, and it was, I'm assuming you were 2020 as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm an international student. I was obviously in Egypt when it happened, and then I remember getting rejected from the universities I initially applied to, like my firm and insurance. And then I did the clearing process, but I don't think they were calling us. We had to like go online, and it was like survival of the fittest, whichever is, whoever's Wi-Fi works best type of thing. Um, and then with York, I, I hadn't initially considered it, but then when I kind of looked at the course, looked at the campus, it just it felt right, like you said. Um, but it was obviously it was a bit, bit of a difficult one because I hadn't been to the UK prior to coming to university, so it was like. I'm, when I come, I'm just going to come and I'll either love it or hate it, but that's how it's going to be type thing. And I feel like that's something that's not talked about enough. Um, but right at the start, I do remember like the recruitment team being very supportive or like the, the clearing team. I'm not sure what you'd call it. Um, but that was really good. And then afterwards, they changed their international baccalaureate grades. I don't know if they did the same for you. And my, the university I initially like applied to accepted me. Um, but then I rejected them because if they weren't going to take me at my worst, I wasn't going to take them type thing. And York just felt right. Um, it was obviously a big change because I'm from Cairo and Cairo's quite loud and busy and trafficy and York's quite scenic and it has lakes. I mean, we have the Nile as well, but you know, it's not, 
it's not quite the same. So it's been it's been a nice change, and like you say, like it just it just feels like home. Like I do feel like I belong here for the most part. Um, but yeah, that's just a bit about my journey into York. And so we're going to move on to engagement. And I feel like with the answer to this, it could mean a lot of different things to you. So just feel free to sway the conversation however you'd like. And so the first thing is, what does student engagement mean to you? So from my personal perspective, I think the student engagement means the university welcomed me. So if I can feel that way, I feel I'm more engaged, I'm more likely to engage or join the university event or lecture or like this conference. So if I feel another way like the university didn't like me as a non-native speaker or they don't have the patience to listen my like uh, English. So I, I think I'm more likely to, to being isolated and not join the university's conference or the event. So I think this is the most important part for me. Okay. Um, to me, I think, I don't know if it's just because I'm only a first year and I haven't had that many experiences so far, but to me it is simply just feeling motivated to go to like your lectures and go to your seminars because I don't know if it's because I'm, I'm a lockdown student, so like for a lot of my sixth form I was online, so you've kind of come conditioned to like, well I get that I can just do it online, so why go to the lecture? So I think it is really important that lectures almost like uh, you fo you're forced to go because they need to be like more interactive I think so I think I'm much more motivated to go if there's like something that I have to do like I can't just do it from home because then I'm like well I'm not gonna bother because I could just do it from bed at 9am instead of actually trek to uni and then do it there like if I'm being completely honest but um yeah just it's mainly just like the feeling of that I've got people that I want to see at uni like friends and like after now, like knowing my lecturers as people rather than just, you know, my lecturers, it's like now I feel much more motivated to go because I enjoy seeing people. So, yeah, for me, it's mainly just like the friendships and relationships and the enjoyment of the content to me is what I find like increases my engagement. I think I like what you said about the end about enjoying the kind of the content. And I think when it comes to engagement, if you go from an academic perspective, if students aren't engaged um, or don't find an interest in what they're learning, then they're just not going to engage. And I think also it's the whole, is what I'm learning adding value to me as an individual, adding value to society, or has an impact on kind of the world? So like now when you think about like primary school, secondary school, I've got my little sisters and siblings saying, oh, um, well, they're not in primary school anymore, but how come we don't learn about taxes or how come we don't learn about this? And I'm like, what's your business with that? But as kind of society <laughs> is going on, you're realizing that people want to learn things that they can actually use. Um, so I think when it comes from like an academic perspective, it's like, okay, am I adapting the way I'm teaching? Um, am I um, ensuring that, okay, even if we're learning quote unquote this boring topic, um, do I ask at the beginning of the lecture, okay, what would you guys like to learn? And then maybe having students kind of maybe create their own kind of teaching so maybe they can come and teach a little bit or um, the lecturer or staff member can like kind of do a little program to um, encourage them to like learn other things because I think after a while uni kind of gets mundane and boring. Like with medicine, medicine is very interesting but you kind of get into a routine um, and our attendance is mandatory. If you don't go, you get in trouble. So a lot of us do go but so many of us might sit, I say us, I'm not part of them, but so many people may sit there and be on their phones or they're disengaged. Um, and it's like, how do I keep your attention? And then I think in terms of like what he was saying about welcoming, I think if the university gives students the opportunity to kind of be welcomed in and um, also find that like, there are different things. So what does the uni have to offer? So whether it be society, sports event, like I was saying to my friends, if you haven't attended a sports event in the uni, then I don't think you've done university because there's something about kind of people coming together collectively to watch a sport or celebrate. And even if like you do business, I do English, you do geography, the fact that we're all cheering for like one team, um, you just kind of feel like you're in a uni and you feel like you're part of like a bigger community. So I would say like get involved, but I think students can only know to get involved if they know what to get involved in. So that works out. 
Yeah, I, I think everyone else has said it very well from different aspects, but as a postgraduate student, it's difficult to be involved in areas outside of lectures, and I'm sure you can speak to that as well, being in medical school, and everyone else with first year. Um, so just to add from a classroom perspective, because I feel like that's where I live at this point, um, Really, it's twofold with engagement. It's about making sure, whether it's a lecture and just the environment as a whole, uh, just creates this cohesive bond between the students because that's where real learning and interaction happens. But then it's also learning how to support individual journeys. And it's really a balancing act. And I don't really know what the best solution to that is or how to find that balance. But overall, I say it's about learning between those two. Yeah, I can definitely agree. I feel like as well when you if you start off on a less engaged note, like it only gets worse. Whereas if you start with the motivation, it kind of goes down. I know with, I don't know if anyone else can relate, but with first year, a lot of this like, content was online. So it was very hard to actually engage with it. While it happened, it was like, oh, we'll watch the recording type thing. But as we, as I went on to, into my second year, like there was more going on at the university in person. And I feel like that made a real difference, I think. Yeah, just real quick to add. So, like, for example, I've never actually had a lecture in a lecture hall ever, and I've been here for three years, um, because, again, starting the lockdown and with medicine, we were still able to kind of come in, which I think was very helpful. So we had, like, kind of PBL seminar groups that we were coming for, like, twice a week, but everything else was online. So I think from that perspective, you're already kind of detached, and a lot of people spent time in their room and was isolated. So when it came to kind of things kind of being open up again, um, it was quite... I guess I think uneasy for people, and I think even yeah. for myself, it was like it's quite overwhelming exactly. as well sometimes. Um, and then you're expected to go to all these different classes, um, and then you're not used to whether it be waking up early or having to run from this building to that building in like two minutes. Um, and so I think when it comes to things like online, even if you're going to kind of hybrid the two, um, I think encouraging um, the fact that being engaged is so important, but this is how we can engage you is useful because, again, for example, coming, having part of it, um, like six form of experience in the lockdown as well, you then probably want to go to classes more because you've been locked up, whereas I'm almost like, oh, I don't really want to go because I've been locked up and I don't really know what it's going to be like. So I think from like an academic kind of perspective, I think it's very important for staff to acknowledge everyone's starting point. Um, and again, this is very optimistic, but if at the beginning having like a talk, like where are we all kind of starting from? So for example, if I'm coming from a different country, language bar barrier might be a thing or how I learn. So if I learn from a basis of um, someone teaches me, they tell me what to do, I go home, I learn it, I go to tuition, I come back, I do my work, I sit my exam in comparison to here where it's more like, okay, group work and partnership. And if I'm not used to that, then that's a big jump. So I think having, obviously there's probably hundreds in the class, but having um, an acknowledgement or understanding of everyone's start in place can then help in terms of how people learn a bit better. And I'm more likely to engage if I think you're trying to understand me a bit more. Yeah, I agree. I think building on from that question, what, what does it feel like for you when you're engaged? I don't know if you wanna. Yeah, I just feel like it like reflects a lot in my exam results when I'm engaged. Like you can really see how much I've enjoyed a module depending on how well I've done in the exams because like yeah, was the sorry was the question how when How I, does it feel? How does it feel? Yeah. Well I, I feel like motivated, just really motivated and like I feel like yeah enjoying the content is really important to me and also like the style of learning and the assessment style as well is really important. Would you say there's a certain assessment style that works best for you? I'd say um, well for my degree like practical like project reports is much more enjoyable than a 24-hour exam because to me these 24-hour open exams I'm like well it might be an essay based on one lecture out of three terms worth of content how motivated am I to revise? Whether well, if it's like an actual exam, I have to learn the content. And I enjoy, I didn't choose this degree like for no reason, like I enjoy the content, so I do want to learn it, but almost it just feels like pointless if I'm just doing a 24 hour exam, which it shouldn't, but I think for everyone it does. Well, for the people I know on my course, it does at least. So definitely that kind of thing. And then just a, a project report because you've like collected the data and then done a report on it and it's individual to whatever you've done. I just find that much more engaging and more of it, personally. Um, I agree with Lily about everything around motivation leading to that sense of engagement um, because it's twofold, really, with thinking about, you know, how 
in the classroom. And I, I don't want to say make it seem like students shouldn't have to put in the effort, but when there's that fostered sense of engagement, it, it becomes the easier choice. It doesn't become forced. And if a student doesn't have to really make themselves known to the department or to the lecturers, I think that's where it becomes um, natural in a way. And among students, whether it's someone who is more introverted or extroverted, just knowing where their place is and that there's always that open line of communication uh, definitely makes me feel more engaged. I feel just so happy the first time I feel I engage in the university because uh, my home student friends, my professor, supervisor, they encourage me a lot just to talk, just speak in English. And before I come to the UK, I'm really enjoying the British show and the American show. So I always think about like, how's that feel if I speak in English with my home student friends? How, how, how is that gonna feel about? So in the first time I joined the university's like event, I speak to native speaker and my home student friends, just feel like, so happy, so I'm really glad. Um, and to just add with the kind of happiness, I think from, again, it's, it feels like money well spent when you're engaging, when you're learning. Um, but I also think, like I love how it's like teaching and learning. So learning doesn't necessarily have to be academic. It could be learning from people. So again, getting involved in that regard. Uh, but I also think engagement for me, like when I'm actually interested, then I feel like you kind of feel comfortable and you also understand that actually um, university is not just about kind of getting the degree, but it's about the people you meet. Um, so for example, like she came from America, I came from London, like we're all from all different places. Um, and this is like the best place to meet people from all over the world. And some people will never get that opportunity again. And so I feel like for me, engagement in that regard is encouraging. And then also kind of seeing the results. So like getting my exam results on Monday and seeing, okay, like engaging really pays off because I've actually um, chosen to learn, and I think from a student perspective, there has to be a willingness to choose to enjoy it. Um, you're not going to enjoy every single aspect of it, but like, at least, okay, maybe this lecture, sorry, it might be a bit boring, okay, fine, how can I um, try and engage with the content, or teach a friend, or kind of encourage yourself to learn it, because again, not everything you're going to enjoy and learn, but there are aspects that it's compulsory. So I think, for me as an individual, when I, I remember like going to third year, and I was like, I'm going to choose to enjoy it, and I think I've like enjoyed every aspect of it. Ooh, no, okay, not every single aspect, but I've enjoyed a good, I've enjoyed a good part of it. Um, and I think just that, again, that decision as an individual. Um, and again, if I was a lecturer, I might go, okay, as students, I want you to commit to enjoying the process, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, but making that choice to want to learn. Um, and if you like make that, sign that contract, for example, I'll partner with you and make sure that I teach what you like, but also what you have to learn and make sure that it's engaging for both parties. Would, I know we've covered this a bit, but would you say that anything specific engages or disengages you in your learning? Um, real quick, I think lack of like academic variety. So when it comes to, like again, with medicine, you learn everything to do with different aspects of health or the body. But then, for example, when it comes to like hematology to do with blood, there are certain like blood diseases. So the only time, I guess, kind of people from an African-Caribbean background is mentioned is when it comes to sickle cell. Um, but then there's so many other things that you can learn or like how skin conditions present with someone with like white skin or black skin is very different. And I've found that in our learning, they don't really like cater towards that. So people have started saying things, but I think when there's like lack of um, that variety, or for example, I learn how it presents on, let's say it's typical like white 52 year old male and it's like, okay, great. But if I go back to London and I go into the hospital, how many of them am I gonna see? And so the lack of certain variety, I think after a while you just disengage. So I'm just then learning for learning sake, because again, I want a degree, I'm Nigerian, I can't like not have a degree, I have to do well. So there's that regard, but then there's also a case of, if there's no variety, then I, I lose interest. And I think if you don't catch a student at the point, if you catch them at the point where they're losing interest, you can kind of regain it. But once they've kind of lost it, they will just stay at home, they won't go to lectures, um, and they'll just kind of sit the exam and hope for the best. And I guess, I don't know how like the grading system works with like, I guess normal uni, but like, let's say it's like 40% to pass, I'll just get the 40% and leave, like it is what it is. Um, whereas like with medicine, like our pass rate was 55, 50? It was like 52% and it was like, oh, that's a step up. So again, you have to kind of actively work with it, um, but also 
again, I think styles of learning is a big thing for me. So for example, I learned by doing things. So having hospital placement meant when I could shadow doctors, I learned way more than just kind of sitting in a lecture. So having that kind of mixture and blend of the two would be helpful because if not, I, I will sit, then I'll listen. But after a while, like my mind goes, and then if I've drifted too far, I might not come back. It's really interesting you say that because I do business and management, so it's quite different in terms of you can very easily fall back because a lot of it's independent. We don't have as many contact hours as like um, natural science courses. Um, so I think what engages me versus disengages me the most is when I see people around me on my course who are actively working, actively going to lectures, actively participating, because to me that's like inspiring. And when you feel like other people around you are doing it, it's like it makes you want to do it as well. So I think the people you're surrounded with are really important. And then also just lectures, like kind of a lot of my lectures that go above and beyond to like make it a good experience and you can tell and it is really appreciated. Um, but I do think if we had more like mandatory, I, I know a lot of students will hate me for saying this, but I feel like if we had more um, sessions that were like mandatory for participation rather than just doing them online, I really think that could increase my engagement because then there'd be more group work and more collaboration essentially. Um, I reflect from my student journey, I'm going to say some like superficial co comments. So it's like, um, when I joined the university at the first year, so I trying to engage with the university and join the event, the so society, but at the beginning, when I joined the like English speaking environment, some of uh, home student or staff member, I think the assumption and, and misunderstanding can make me feel like hard to engage because, for example, if I join an event, there is like, I remember almost no staff member or home student talk to me and say hi to me. I think it's like uh, they, they might have some assumption like international student or non-native speaker, international student, they can't speak proper English. So I think if that happened, I'm joining an event, nobody say hi, and no eye contact, they, they don't even look at me. I feel like being isolated, so maybe I'm not going to join the event again. Sorry. Maybe I'm not going to join the event again. But I also re realized uh, that is also a part of stereotype of me, because uh, as a non-native, non-native international student, we are quite enjoying staying in our comfort zone. So we just hang out with our like uh, same language friends. So if we're doing that, we are not open to the English speaking environment. So because I talked to one of my home student friends, I was like, why you didn't say hi to me at the beginning? And he said, oh, I'm really afraid to say hi to you. So I think this is like a barrier from the home student staff member and the international student need to break. And uh, the misunderstanding can make like so many negative impact on student journey. Would you say it happens a lot with um, group work as well on your course or more just like social interactions? This is a really interesting question because when I work in the university, I heard for example, if some program, they have quite highly international student. So I, I heard a lot from my home student friends or they read some issues like home student feel isolated in the group work. It's really interesting because they, they mentioned the international student, they just speak their own language and they don't understand. They don't speak in English. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. And we kind of working that together and have some progress. It's like, I think the misunderstanding and the language barrier is like really big challenge, uh, not just for international students, also for yeah. home students. And sorry, real quick, just to add, I think it's also a case of how people are taught. So when my friend and I were in Greece, um, a lot of students are taught to just kind of learn from the lecturers in comparison to kind of group work. So if that's my understanding, then coming to the UK and having group work you almost have to teach me how to be in a group or be a part of a team, which is why, again, I'm biased. I play rugby, so join a sport, you be a part of a team, you know how to do teamwork. But, um, but I think it's also something where 
um, that's where I think where lecturers can kind of come in and be like, okay, this is what kind of group work looks like, or provide a framework, because especially like, for example, if you're only here for a year, there's only so much you can learn in a year in comparison to three years or four years or five in my case. Um, and I think also from that regard, again, kind of that feeling of um, I'm different, again, it's not a problem, but it's, a, it's, a, it's acknowledging that, for example, like me joining uh, medicine through clearing, even though like I'm smart, but like you, it almost, I almost felt like, not that I'm not meant to be here, but um, you kind of feel othered or different. And it's not something that people did to me, but I think I kind of did to myself. So again, there are, there are aspects that as, I say as staff members, I'm not a staff, but as a lecturer that you can't change in the student, but you can encourage them. Because again, coming through clearing, then there's an element of like imposter syndrome of like a lot of students. So then in like medicine, for example, someone like a lecturer would ask a question or the doctors would ask a question and you'd hear someone's answer. And you're like, how many years have you been doing this degree for? But that's just because they know something about this. And I'm here sitting there like, I know nothing. Um, I joined through clearing. Like, I'm not even technically supposed to be here kind of thing. And so it's then, again, that encouragement throughout to whether it be teamwork or whether it be um, you're exactly where you're meant to be, you belong. Um, and if there's any point maybe you don't feel like that, then you can come to us. And if you don't, let's say there's like a... Um, like we have PBL tutors that you can kind of go and speak to. You have like academic check-ins. And I think, I know with a lot of my friends who have like tutor check-ins, they check at the beginning of the year and then again, email at the end of the year just before they finish. And I think it would be good to have maybe one in between. Um, but I think that's also helpful if like I know who my lecturer is. So almost like a lecturer CV. So if I, like my first introductory lesson, I would want you to be like, hey, this is, I'm lecturer so-and-so, this is what I do, this is my area of interest, this is why I'm interested in this. So almost like a mini profile, because I feel like you might know me, but I, would, I don't know you. And a lot of people may not research, like I love a good Google and LinkedIn stalking. Um, so you can find out who the people are and what they're interested in. But if there's that detachment between like whether I know you or not, then I think that has a big influence on whether I wanna engage or listen. And then I feel like so many people then kind of just, what's the word, kind of like merge into the background. Um, and you would never know that they were in your class or um, they had a problem. And then I think also from like a mindset perspective, like when it comes to someone's mental health, I think that can like cause you to disengage. So if I'm genuinely not feeling well, um, I won't want to come. And again, if I feel like I'm in a number, then if I haven't come to like eight sessions um, and you don't know, then it's like, I don't belong here. Whereas like, again, medicine's a bit different because we're not a lot smaller, but they, we kind of have like different placements. So there was a time I didn't go to a class. Well, I, I intended to go. I think the time has got mixed up. And I remember they called me and was like, where are you? And I was like, oh, um, I'm currently not feeling well. They're like, not a problem. How can we support you kind of thing? And I think for me, it was even shocking, the fact that they called me and were like checking in. I understand not every lecturer can do that. But if you've kind of seen, for example, a student hasn't come quite a bit, how can I kind of check in? Is everything okay? And if I don't know where to, if I don't know how to help you, can I signpost you to the right place? And I think that would be very helpful for students. See, that's really interesting you say that because with my course, it's, it's really not like that. I just think it's the way it's structured because we're a lot of students and it's like the lectures aren't really mandatory type thing. Um, but I really liked what you said about knowing your lecture because I think there's a certain authenticity that comes with lectures starting off, like kicking off the modules, kind of sharing about their own experiences or what they've done, and it makes you feel more, like, makes you feel like you can relate to them. It's more of a human connection, because obviously the lectures are so big, it's sometimes hard to engage with them, so I think that's really important. I only wanted to um, just add to what you said earlier about, like, definitely seminars, tutorials, those sort of things, much more engaging than a lecture, but obviously understand that you know, with such big like cohorts, it's difficult to do that because you need smaller groups and then more slots. So it is easy, I understand, to do like a one hour lecture, but where possible, just a seminar. Or if that's not possible, even like questions at the end of a lecture, potentially to prepare for the next lecture so that it's got that seminar kind of feel. Because for my seminars, we had to prepare answers to questions and then sort of talk about them. So even if you did that for a lecture and then had to have them prepared for the next one and there would be that like audience participation as such, just like that kind of motivation and people can, I mean people could choose not to do them but me personally I would choose to, um, so yeah that kind of thing to me. Yeah. Does anyone want to add anything? Um, I'll just quickly add, I'm conscious, conscious of time, but um, 
just seeing the lectures and their level of motivation and inspiration for the lecture content itself, I was never a statistics focused person. And coming to this university, five of my modules have been very statistics heavy. And I'm not just saying this because two of them are in this room, um, but just seeing the lecturers' passions for um, talking about theories that I had no idea existed and building that confidence of being able to build a program, run models, interpret the models uh, has made all the difference just because the lecturers cared and, and poured that focus into us as well. Yeah. Um, I realize that we've gone a bit over time. I feel like we could talk about this all day. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything about the assessments or kind of their engagement and disengagement with their courses or if we should move on to, yes, please. I'm waiting for this time for a long time. Amazing. So, <laughs> I'm just going to like finish as soon as possible. So, uh, I I think for in terms of the engagement, especially for one year masters, they when they arrive to the UK, they know nothing about that, especially for international students. So I think the induction need to like being like continuing induction to let student know uh, what resources is available and what's invent, what's like helpful project is available for them. So at the beginning, if the information is like really huge information for them, they don't know what's going on. And this is one thing I want to mention. And an another one I want to suggest, this is really good opportunity because we have so many staff member here. And I mentioned that to Louis, Jess, Jen, many times. So I think the language support for international students is extremely important than we think. Because I'm going to say like a really simple example. For example, in China, we're learning English. We're, we're learning the wrong English. We, we're learning the English from the book. So this is why so many students, they got quite higher IELTS mark. And they come to the UK, they don't know how to speak in English. So, this is a really big challenge for our university and international student. They need to speak in English first so they, they can join the uh, university. They can feel more engagement. They can finish and improve their assessment. So uh, I think uh, many staff member or uh, I won't say staff member, I think a lot of people, including me, and we have assumption, it's like if a student passed their ELSE exam, they are assumed to have the ability to speak in English or engage in the seminar. But actually, no, it's, it's not. They can't. So I think this is really important. Because, uh, for example, in China, there's many education institutions, right? So they're teaching, they're teaching students who are going to learn abroad, to learn English. So they're not teaching them. They ask them to memory almost all of the correct answer for post the exam. So if that happened, how, how, how they can speak in English? How they can engage? So I think the language support is extremely important than we think. Thank you. I think that's a really important note to close on. Um, but I don't know if anyone has any final thoughts or if we should bring it to a close. We don't have time, unfortunately, but I just wanted to say a big thank you. It's been great like, getting to know you guys and kind of bringing your authentic experiences. And thank you for listening to us.